Good evening, and welcome to the third event of the Johns Hopkins Symposium on Foreign Affairs. We're so glad that you could join us. Today, Professor Noam Chomsky will address the topic, U.S. Foreign Policy in a Globalized World. Noam Chomsky has been a professor of linguistics, linguistic theory, syntax, semantics, and philosophy of language at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology since 1955. Regarded as one of the nation's most prominent political dissidents, he has authored more than 30 books on United States foreign policy and international politics, as well as numerous articles and essays. Recently, Professor Chomsky has written on topics including U.S. intervention in the Third World, the crisis in the Balkans, rogue states, and the passion of free markets. Professor Noam Chomsky earned his Bachelor of Arts degree, Master's degree, and Ph.D. from the University of Pennsylvania. He has taught at Columbia, Stanford, and Oxford Universities. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Noam Chomsky. begin with the term globalization. Uh, it's uh, conventionally used now uh, to refer to a, a very specific form of international integration of international society that's uh, been uh, proceeding for about 25 years, uh, extending, recapitulating traditional patterns, but with some important changes as well. Uh, the process is sometimes described as a kind of force of nature. Uh, it's, uh, uh, there is no alternative, Tina, Maggie, Maggie Thatcher's famous phrase. Uh, those slogans are convenient for the beneficiaries of the process, but uh, they don't even have the merit of the ritualistic incantations of uh, Marx's Iron Laws of History and uh, they can be dismissed. There are many choices available within the existing framework of institutions, and the institutions are no more immutable now than they've ever been throughout history. At every point, we can ask why certain specific choices are made, uh, whether they are the paths that should be chosen, or whether they should, and whether they should then be followed or altered or maybe quite drastically modified. Uh, in the past year, the global issues have very largely been framed in terms of uh, sovereignty, meaning the rights of political entities uh, to, be, to follow their own course, maybe benign, maybe ugly, uh, and to do so free from external interference. Uh, in the real world, external interference means uh, interference by highly concentrated power, uh, the major center, of course, in the United States, this uh, concentrated global power is called by various names, depending on which aspect of the problems of sovereignty and freedom we have in mind. So sometimes it's called the Washington Consensus or the Wall Street uh, Treasury Complex, Jagdish Bhagwati's phrase, economist at Columbia, or it's called NATO or uh, the International Economic Bureaucracy or G7 or G3 or sometimes more realistically G1. Uh, and uh, from a more fundamental point of view, uh, we could describe it as an array of uh, mega corporations, um, often linked to one another by strategic alliances, which administer the global economy uh, that includes the interchanges that are misleadingly called trade uh, in a kind of global mercantilism with tendencies towards oligopoly in most sectors, uh, heavily reliant on the state sector to create the dynamic components of the economy to socialize costs and risks and to subdue recalcitrant elements. Kind of a mouthful, but I think it's a fairly accurate first approximation to what we might call really existing globalization. Uh, the issues of sovereignty and freedom arise in two domains, uh, dramatically so in the last year. One domain has to do with sovereign right to be free from military intervention. 
I hear the questions arise in a world order based on sovereign states. Uh, the second category has to do with the right to be uh, uh, free to follow one's own path in the face of uh, socioeconomic intervention. I hear the questions arise in the framework of the corporate mercantilism that's linked to state power and the international bureaucracies. And in both domains, for obvious reasons, uh, the dominant role is that of the United States. Uh, well, uh, both of these issues, kinds of issues, have been lively and contentious in the past year because of time limits. I'll say only a few words about the military political intervention reluctantly. There's a lot to say about it, and then I'll turn to some comments on the other. Uh, uh, with regard to the issue of military intervention and sovereignty, uh, the last year has been quite an interesting and in some ways unusual one. Uh, from early 1999, just about beginning just about a year ago, uh, there has been a remarkable chorus of self-adulation uh, of a kind rarely seen outside totalitarian states, uh, having to do with uh, NATO's bombing of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. This was, oh, these are just a few representative quotes from the mainstream and leading figures. Uh, this was regarded as a landmark in international relations, uh, opening a new era in which the enlightened states will use force where they believe it to be just, uh, disregarding the restrictive old rules like the UN Charter in favor of modern notions of justice that they will fashion. Uh, the enlightened states, we are told, are led by an idealistic new world bent on ending inhumanity, namely the United States, which is now at the height of its glory, uh, opposed only by the defiant, the indolent, and the miscreant, uh, the disorderly elements of the world. Uh, that's roughly the world view within the enlightened states. Uh, no particular criterion is offered as to how you join the club, uh, apparently, but it's kind of self-anointed enlightened states. Uh, outside the club, the circle of enlightened states, uh, the picture was quite different. It's kind of interesting that little of it was reported here, but one can find it. Uh, there's a very broad range of opinion outside of Europe and the United States. Uh, its uh, main perspective was probably captured rather accurately by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, uh, who gets quoted here when he says the right kind of things, but not this time. Uh, he described what he called the aggressors uh, as opening a new era in which might is right. Uh, if the protection of the oppressed was their real concern, uh, they could have been defending, for example, the miserable Kurds. He says, for example, because it's only one case, though a rather revealing one. Uh, a leading uh, military strategic analyst, analyst in Israel uh, described the new era as a return to the colonial era. Uh, the use of force is, as in the colonial era, is cloaked in moralistic righteousness. Now, he described the enlightened states as a danger to the world, uh, warned that their actions are going to lead to nuclear and other kinds of proliferation because others will simply have to develop weapons of mass destruction to defend themselves against the predatory powers uh, that are now out of control, facing no deterrent. Uh, similar views were quite widely expressed throughout a good part of the world, most of it, in fact. Uh, Solzhenitsyn's reference to the miserable Kurds is quite appropriate. Uh, he was speaking just about at the time when NATO was commemorating its 50th anniversary in Washington last April. Uh, it wasn't a celebration because the uh, meeting was held under the somber shadow of ethnic cleansing right across the borders of NATO. Uh, it took rather impressive discipline for the participants in the meeting and commentators on it not to notice that some of the worst ethnic cleansing of the 90s was within NATO, not across its borders, uh, namely in the southeastern part of NATO. Uh, where uh, just in the Clinton years, uh, two to three million people were made refugees, uh, tens of thousands killed, uh, 3,500 villages destroyed. That's seven times 
Kosovo under NATO bombing. Uh, all of this was uh, uh, significantly re relied significantly on a huge flow of arms from the United States uh, escalating as the atrocities peaked uh, through the Clinton years. But somehow that was missed. Uh, the difference of judgment about the enlightened states was actually being put to a rather clear test uh, exactly at the time uh, that the fine words were uh, pouring out in such an impressive uh, stream. Uh, so while the enlightened states and their educated elites were praising themselves for their uh, astonishing humanism, uh, uh, they had a very good opportunity to apply the modern notions of justice that they were fashioning to end in humanity, and it's instructive to see how they did so. Uh, in November, this is the second major uh, atrocity that reached prominence in 1999. Uh, in November 1988, uh, new contingents of uh, the uh, uh, Indonesian commandos, Casas commandos, who are renowned for their braver, um, uh, sadism and the brutality, uh, and had just emerged from new U.S. training, Operation Iron Balance in 1998, which was conducted more or less in secret because it was in violation of congressional intention and legislation. Uh, they entered the East Timor along with about 5,000 new recruits. And in February 1999, they initiated a military operation, Operation Clean Sweep, uh, which was uh, an operation designed to uh, uh, murder, uh, destroy, uh, intimidate, which they did on a vast scale, uh, including major massacres, the most famous of them, maybe the massacre in Liquisa, uh, where maybe 50 or 60 people were murdered in a church in which they'd taken refuge in April. Uh, the, uh, uh, according to uh, rather credible church sources in, in East Timor, uh, they had killed about three to 5,000 people uh, just in the first months of the year, from February through July, uh, more later. Uh, and they were giving very clear and explicit warnings, which it took, took a lot of effort to miss, uh, that much worse was going to come uh, after the referendum scheduled for August if the population uh, voted for independence. Uh, with astonishing uh, bravery, the population did vote for independence. Virtually everyone voted, about 80% for independence, although they were totally defenseless uh, and at the mercy of uh, uh, the Indonesian forces, the U.S. armed and trained Indonesian forces and their paramilitaries that they organized. Uh, shortly after that, about 85% of the population was brutally driven from their homes, that's 750,000 people, and the country was mostly destroyed and a quarter of a million or so were uh, driven into Indonesian territory, where about 150,000 still remain in concentration camps that have limited access. Uh, notice that in this case, there was no issue of sovereignty. These are atrocities going on where there's no question of sovereignty. Uh, Indonesia's sovereign rights in East Timor were comparable to those of Nazi Germany and occupied France. Uh, Indonesia had invaded in 1975. It had been ordered at once by the Security Council to withdraw uh, immediately. Uh, the United States actually voted for that resolution, but uh, it was meaningless for reasons explained by the U.S. Ambassador, U.N. Ambassador Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who wrote his memoirs a couple of years afterwards, and explained uh, in words that uh, should be memorized by anyone who takes their freedom seriously, uh, Moynihan explained that although the U.S. voted for the U.N. resolution, the State Department wanted things to turn out as they did, and my instructions, he said, were to render the United Nations utterly ineffective in anything it might do, uh, instructions which I carried out, he says, with considerable success. And he describes the success, in fact. He says, within two months, about 60,000 people were killed, 10% uh, of the population, uh, within a few years, uh, thanks to a new flow of arms from the Carter administration, those numbers went up to about maybe 200,000 or so, something like a third or quarter of the population. And then atrocities continued for the following, in the following years, 
with constant U.S. diplomatic and military support. Uh, Britain joined in in 1978 as the atrocities reached near genocidal levels and has also been arming and training uh, the Indonesian occupying forces since. So their sole claim to sovereignty was that the invasion and massacre, one of the worst of the latter part of the 20th century, was authorized by the United States, which participated in it uh, crucially throughout. And in that sense, uh, it was authorized. But beyond that, there was no issue of sovereignty. Uh, the, uh, uh, in 1999, as I mentioned, the atrocities picked up once again. Uh, throughout, uh, the United States and Britain continued uh, to support uh, the Indonesian military occupiers. Uh, the arms continued to flow. Uh, as I mentioned, military training went on through 1998. Uh, in fact, the U.S. was conducting joint military operations with the Indonesian Army uh, in late, by, even in late August 1999. Throughout all this period, there was an official stand. Uh, it was reiterated uh, again by Defense Secretary William Cohen on September 8th. That's after all of the atrocities that I've described including driving out 85% of the population and wiping out most of the country. The position reiterated then was that it is the responsibility of the government of Indonesia and we don't want to take it away from them. Now, those are the new principles of justice fashioned by the enlightened states. Uh, a few days after that, September 11th, uh, under mounting domestic pressure and particularly international pressure, almost all of it from Australia, uh, the Clinton administration finally uh, gave some indicated to the Indonesian generals that the game was over. Uh, within a day, they had reversed course and announced their withdrawal. Uh, events which reveal quite clearly the latent power uh, that has always been available uh, if uh, there had ever been a will to use it. Uh, after this, the U.S. continued to do nothing following the principles of the enlightened states. Uh, there were maybe half a million refugees starving in the mountains. There were no airdrops to them. Uh, the Air Force is quite capable of targeting civilian targets in Serbia or anywhere else, but not dropping food to starving refugees who were driven there by forces armed and trained by the United States. And rather strikingly, there was no call for it. Uh, you'll search in vain for a call to suggest that the U.S might, for example, carry out airdrops. Uh, as I said, there are 150,000 who remain in Indonesian concentration camps, uh, very limited access by it's the only place in the world where the UN, uh, UNHCR, the main refugee organization, doesn't have access. Hundreds, if not thousands, are dying. Children are particularly vulnerable. The U.S. is doing absolutely nothing. You know, could end that in three seconds if it wanted to. Uh, there is a small uh, UN peacekeeping force, too large for the enlightened states. Uh, Clinton called for a reduction of the peacekeeping force and is providing virtually no support for it. Uh, the UN uh, peacekeeping force called for forensic experts uh, to try to, uh, so that it would be possible to find out what happened. The Kosovo was just swarm swarming with thousands of forensic experts experts immediately to try to find any justification for the bombing. Uh, here there are very few, and those few were delayed. Uh, they were crucially they were delayed for about five months. They were delayed until after the rainy season uh, started, which would, as had been warned, wipe away uh, most evidence that was available. So there's no danger of finding out what happened. Uh, as distinct from Serbia, there's no international tribunal. Uh, the UN Commission of Inquiry did call for an international tribunal, but that was killed by the great powers. Uh, it'll, in the, it's their responsibility, and uh, we don't want to take it away from them, uh, even though uh, the Indonesian president has already announced a pardon for the leading, uh, for the top Indonesian general, General Wiranto, just in case a tribunal of any kind gets out of hand. Uh, there are no reparations for the awful crimes that the United States has committed there over the past 25 years, and certainly no inquiry into the decisive U.S. role since December 1975, right through mid-September 1999. Well, there could hardly be a, all of this is going on in parallel with this great chorus of self-adulation. 
uh, and there could hardly be a clearer illustration uh, of what the new enlightenment uh, really means. Uh, well, what about the example that inspired this immense flood of uh, uh, self-praise? Uh, when the bombing uh, began, Clinton and others pointed out that, yes, it's true, sometimes we look away, but when ethnic conflict turns into ethnic cleansing, we must act. There was only two problems with that. Uh, one is that the United States, including Clinton, did not look away in Turkey or East Timor or plenty of other places. Colombia is another case right now, and there are many others. Rather, it looked right there very carefully, and it acted decisively to escalate the atrocities. Uh, there was no need for a bombing. There was no need for sanctions, even threats. All that was necessary was just to withdraw participation. Uh, the saying that we sometimes look away or we can't do everything is not only an evasion, but an extremely cowardly evasion. Uh, and you might check to see how often that's pointed out. Uh, answer, essentially, never. Uh, secondly, uh, ethnic conflict, uh, it's not correct that ethnic conflict turned into ethnic cleansing. It actually, it did, but it did after the bombing. Uh, the ethnic cleansing was a consequence, not a cause. That's not a controversial fact. Now just look at the data. Now the evidence was quite overwhelming uh, at the time. A great deal of evidence has been released since then in an effort to try to justify the bombing, which makes the evidence particularly interesting. State Department has produced two substantial collections of documents. Uh, the OSCE, the uh, Europe-based international organization, has produced extensive reports. NATO reports are now available. Uh, also, the reports of the international monitors, the KVN monitors, uh, the UN uh, humanitarian organizations, which were free to go around the Kosovo without harassment, they report, up to the bombing. All of that evidence is now available. One can look at it. It very strongly supports the judgment of NATO commander, General Mark Clark, uh, who informed the press when the bombing began uh, on March 24th, well, he told them on March 26th, uh, that it was entirely predictable in his word that the bombing uh, would uh, lead to a sharp escalation uh, of atrocities, including ethnic cleansing, which had not been taking place. And shortly after, he informed the press again that ethnic cleansing was never a concern of the political leadership, nor of the military operation that he commanded, which is not surprising since it wasn't going on uh, before the bombing began. It was the anticipated consequence of the bombing, and that anticipation was quickly fulfilled. Now, the OSCE reports, which are some of the most detailed, uh, also point out that the uh, expulsions, the kind of 800,000 or so people, rather like East Timor, uh, were taking place, uh, according to the OSCE analysis, in uh, the areas of guerrilla activity uh, and along potential invasion routes. Not very pleasant, but in fact extremely ugly and criminal, but uh, not all that surprising when a country is being bombed. And those were the anticipated consequences. we clearly anticipated that, we know. Well, we can debate the reasons for all of this, but the plea of humanitarian intent is rather hard to take seriously. Uh, in fact, it's no more a factor in planning in this case than it's been in the past. Although appeals to humanitarian intent are quite common, in fact, almost universal, including Hitler and Mussolini and a long and distinguished list of others. Uh, well, let's turn to the second category, uh, questions of uh, sovereignty in the domain of uh, economic and social policy uh, internally or internationally. Uh, here, uh, we're shifting over to the framework of uh, the really existing globalization of the past 25 years. Uh, let me begin with a couple of concrete illustrations in terms of the general picture. Uh, the illustrations, I think, are representative and instructive. And then I'll turn to the picture in which they find their place. So let me begin with two examples, uh, one from the south, one from the north, conventional euphemism for the imperial and colonial world. Uh, so I'll pick the leading state capitalist democracy in, in each 
region for south and the north. Uh, so the first example is India, leading state capitalist democracy of the south. Uh, the government of India has a central uh, statistical organization which puts out annual reviews of economic and social statistics, and they're considered rather reliable. Uh, a recent one just came out. It runs through 1998. Uh, the population of India, of course, is mostly rural, so the most interesting issues have to do with the state of the rural population. Uh, the study, uh, and earlier ones, uh, reveal that, uh, up, that uh, up until about 1990, uh, it, it studies three basic things, rural poverty, uh, per capita consumption in the rural areas, and per capita output. General conclusion is that up till about 1990, uh, there was a steady, sometimes sharp decline in rural poverty. There was a sharp increase in uh, per capita consumption in the rural areas and a steady growth of per capita output. Uh, since 1990, the figures change. Uh, rural poverty has stagnated or increased. Uh, per capita consumption has stagnated or declined. And the rate of growth in the rural uh, sector has been cut almost in half. So what happened in 1990? Well, 1990 is the year when India instituted the so-called neoliberal reforms. Uh, it uh, liberalized markets, uh, eased conditions for foreign investors, uh, encouraged export, including agro-export and imports of uh, agricultural and other products, and it cut back in government programs targeting the rural, rural development, uh, infrastructure, health, and sanitation, uh, basically the Washington Consensus. They didn't go all the way, so they didn't yet financially carry out full financial liberalization. It's widely recognized that uh, that fact saved them from the contagion, contagion of 1997-98. Since they hadn't liberalized markets yet, they weren't caught up in it, uh, along with a few other places that also hadn't liberalized China, Taiwan, Chile. Uh, well, India is considered one of the star pupils of the uh, uh, held up as one of the great successes of the Washington Consensus. And by some measures, that's true. Uh, there are beneficiaries, uh, privileged sectors in India, which is a large number of people. Uh, they have benefited substantially. Uh, inequality, which, is, which was always quite high in India, has increased very significantly. The share of the uh, rural areas uh, in total income has fallen sharply, and remember that's considerable majority, and other beneficiaries include international investors, uh, corporations, banks, uh, PR firms. In fact, the, as India liberalized, the first U.S. corporations to move in there in a massive way were the public relations firms uh, with the reasonable anticipation that if they could control uh, attitudes, then they could also control marketing. Uh, that's... Uh, uh, Consequences for the quality of life of the poor majority don't require any comment. Uh, that's a gen that picture is rather typical of what's called the developing world. In Latin America, uh, reduction of the labor share in income has been a consistent effect of the neoliberal reforms. That's been pointed out quite long, many times. Uh, the World Bank just a few weeks ago uh, announced that there has been no improvement in Latin America in the past 20 years of neoliberal reforms uh, after quite significant improvements in the preceding years. Uh, Mexico is an interesting case. It's unusually privileged because it's, uh, by the usual standards, because it's integrated into the North American economies, the rich economies, and it's described as separating itself from the Latin American model according to standard versions, even been given a seal of approval just a couple of weeks ago by Moody's doing so well. Uh, since uh, NAFTA was instituted, uh, wages have fallen about 25%. Uh, that follows a sharp decline from 1982 when the neoliberal reforms were instituted. Uh, the minimum wage has fallen to uh, about 80% since 1982. Minimum wage entails 
the wage scale at the lower end, of course. Uh, similar uh, conclusions have been drawn about Africa. There's a recent study by several economists and uh, anthropologists who specialize on Africa, which I'll quote their conclusion. It concludes that the imposition of the Washington Consensus in the early 80s helped to precipitate a catastrophe in which virtually all of the social, educational, and public health gains made in the 1960s and 1970s have been wiped out. That's similar to rural India, uh, Latin America, uh, Russia, since it returned to the fold, and many others. Uh, these outcomes are not particularly surprising. They were predictable and indeed predicted, uh, and they're pretty clear consequences of the specific policy choices uh, that were taken in constructing a very specific form of international integration, which happens to be geared to the interests of the designers, not surprisingly, most policies are, uh, and the sectors of uh, power and privilege that they represent. What happens to others is kind of incidental. Uh, well, that's the first example. Largest state capitalist democracy in the South and others in the South. Let's turn to the second example. Uh, the richest and most important state capitalist democracy of the North, hence of the world. Uh, as in the case of India, uh, I'll uh, make use of a recent publication, this one non-governmental, uh, called The Social Health of, Health of the Nation. That's the latest of the annual reviews of that topic by uh, Fordham University Institute, which has been monitoring this for years and the only place that is. Uh, the study makes a number of important observations. Uh, one of them is familiar. It points out that the standard economic measures are very severely flawed, uh, like, of course, domestic product, GDP. Uh, for one thing, they ignore so-called externalities, that is, costs that don't enter into the market because they're social rather than individual. And these costs are huge, and they're ignored. Uh, but worse still, uh, those costs that are ignored uh, actually improve economic health by the conventional measures. So, say, take pollution, which is an externality. Uh, pollution causes disease, like, say, cancer, and disease uh, leads to uh, medical attention and medical bills and to hospital construction and so on, and all of that improves the GDP. Uh, or take uh, cutbacks in uh, infrastructure uh, uh, maintenance. A couple of years ago, the Department of Transform uh, Transportation did a study in which they tried to, uh, they estimated the savings that had come from the significant cutbacks in uh, repairing of roads, and they compared that to the costs to uh, drivers, you know, from hitting potholes and that sort of thing. And it turned out the costs were considerably greater than the gains, uh, but from the point of view of conventional measures of the economy, uh, both the costs it was all an improvement. Uh, the cutback in government expenditure is a good thing for the economy. Anybody who's taken an economics course knows that. Uh, and uh, the uh, costs of uh, damage to cars also improves the economy. Uh, you have to go to the you know, mechanic and you pay them and they need new parts and you have to buy a new car and consumption increases and production increases and it's all great. Uh, or take the uh, what's become the major technique of social control in the United States, uh, criminalizing victimless acts on the part of uh, poor people and minorities. Uh, that's the major device for controlling what criminologists call the dangerous classes. Well, it's a social malady, uh, but uh, it makes a very substantial contribution to the economy, to GDP, uh, prison construction, uh, service, uh, one of the biggest growing service occupations is prison guard and so on. Uh, this has reached an astonishing scale in the United States. It's way out of line with any other uh, industrial country, maybe 10 times as high, just in the last 20 years, this same period. Uh, despite the uh, flaws of GDP, the Fordham study accepts the conventional measures, uh, and it asks how the conventional measures relate to social health uh, as measured by standard social indicators. Uh, well, here are a number of other interesting observations. One is that the United States is virtually alone, maybe completely alone in the industrial world, uh, in not having uh, an official compilation of social reports. Uh, every other 
other industrial countries have them. Even Turkey puts out an annual survey. Most others do, maybe all. Uh, there was one once in the United States. It was under the Hoover administration. That was the last one. Uh, the, uh, uh, the result of this is that the data are kind of hard to come by. In fact, the data are pretty poor. So data on things like homelessness or hunger or illiteracy and so on are not these, not, these questions are not very seriously investigated, except by a few mavericks like uh, Vicente Navarro of Johns Hopkins. Uh, but they're done by individuals, you know, not by governmental agencies. Uh, the Fordham study, which is the only one that tries to do it in a systematic way, put together the best data they can compile, and they concluded that the United States is in a serious social recession. That's their word. Uh, the uh, trend lines, again, are instructive. Uh, from 1959 until the present, gross domestic product rises fairly steadily. There are variations, but it keeps going up. Uh, until the mid-1970s, the index of social health uh, pretty well tracks GDP. Uh, after that, it diverges. Uh, it declines. From the mid-70s, the index of social health declines, while GDP continues to go up. Uh, and uh, um, it's actually declined by now to below, below the level of 1959. Uh, well, you can raise various questions about the data, but the tendencies are pretty clear, uh, and they're also illustrated by other measures. So take, again, minimum wage, which is quite an important measure, remember, because that has to do with the wage scale throughout the whole lower end of pay. Uh, minimum wage tracked uh, GDP, the growth of the economy, um, up until about 19 roughly 1970, about the same period. Uh, the, uh, uh, at that, from, from the mid-70s on, there's been a steady decline in minimum wage. That means an absolute decline, decline in real value. By now, it's back to about 1960 in real terms. Uh, meanwhile, productivity has, of course, continually increased. Uh, if the minimum wage had continued to track productivity increase, as it should, at least, uh, then it would be about twice what it is now, roughly $12 an hour. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, these are quite important facts. It's the, part of the reason for the great significance of, minimum, of what are called living wage campaigns in many communities in the United States, and in fact right on this campus, uh, that has to do with this astonishing fact that I've just mentioned. And it is remarkable. The United States has long been, and for centuries, in fact, been the richest country in the world. It has uh, unparalleled advantages. It should be far in the lead in social health if the economy were functioning in anything like a reasonable fashion with steady improvement over time. Uh, and that was true for a long time, uh, considerably so from the end of the Second World War up till about 1975. But since the mid-1970s, that's been very far from true, uh, even if we accept the highly misleading conventional economic indicators. Well, that date is significant, just as in the case of India. Uh, that's the time of the onset of the neoliberal reforms of what's called globalization. Uh, it was in the mid-70s that the post-war economic system, the Bretton Woods system, was dismantled. Uh, capital flows were liberalized, capital markets were liberalized, and exchange rates were allowed to flow. Uh, since then, the international economy has changed radically. I happen to be quoting from a new book by two leading economists, but that fact's widely recognized. Uh, there were enormous repercussions. This is perhaps the most important event in international affairs in terms of its human consequences in the past half century. Uh, one consequence was pointed out by the Bretton Woods Commission eminently respectable commission headed by Paul Volcker a couple of years ago, uh, they concluded, I'm quoting, that long-term growth in the major industrial countries has been cut in half uh, since the onset of neoliberal reforms, uh, in part, they believe, uh, a result of fluctuating exchange rates. Uh, that's led to an astronomical uh, increase in speculative capital, most of it very short term, which has a whole range of harmful effects for the economy. And there are similar effects elsewhere, not just in the industrial countries. Uh, the UN Conference on Trade and Development, the main UN research agency, UNCTAD, uh, 
Uh, they had just a couple of weeks ago published their 1999 reports, World Investment Report and Trade and Development Report, and they point out that developed, the so-called developing countries, the countries of the South, uh, their economic growth in the 1990s is well below the 1970s, and their trade deficits have uh, increased considerably. Actually, the main exception to this was the Asian economies uh, that had uh, abandoned uh, the religion that markets know best and relied on government policies for promotion of economic growth. Uh, I'm quoting Joseph Stiglitz, the chief economist of the World Bank, recently retired. Uh, he lists uh, a variety of, uh, process of uh, programs that were crucial uh, to this, uh, their growth, which, was, which did separate them from the rest of the international economy. And these are uh, programs that were also followed by the today's rich countries during the days when they developed, from including England and the United States and, uh, for the present. Uh, those policies are now banned. Uh, under the World Trade Organization regime. In fact, one of its crucial components was to ban the policies that had led to economic growth everywhere, from England up to the newly industrial, industrial countries of Asia. It's under, for those of you who know about this stuff, under the so-called trims and trips conditions, uh, which are highly protectionist and which uh, uh, are formulated so that they in, they're anti-developmental. They are designed to impede growth and development and to ensure uh, monopolization of power and the uh, literal monopolization uh, in the corporations of the North, primarily the United States. Uh, the, uh, so that's both the North and the South. Uh, the uh, financial liberalization uh, in the, the mid-1990s in the Asian societies, South Korea and others, is very widely recognized to be a factor, maybe a major factor, in the financial crises that spread through the region, and in fact, the world shortly afterward, contagion effects were very severe. Notice that these effects are sort of like pollution. Uh, that is, they're externalities. Uh, they're not considered by risk analysts. If you're a risk analyst for a corporation, you don't take into account what's called systemic risk, you know, the threat of contagion to the whole society. That's not your business. Just like pollution isn't your business if you're constructing a factory. So these are externalities. Uh, which means that the costs are socialized and that the market underprices the costs. It's a structural fact. Uh, the, uh, it's uh, because of these facts, that's the reason why about a century ago, uh, in all the industrial societies, uh, financial markets were regulated uh, because they were just leading to total catastrophe. Uh, so the, but the regulation that was instituted internal to countries is, un is rejected by the Washington consensus in the international arena. That's a major problem today, well recognized even in the economic report of the president, uh, though there are, again are beneficiaries, primarily financial institutions. Uh, well, the uh, tendencies described by the Fulker Commission and the and UNCTAD are also discussed in a lot of technical studies. Uh, there's variation, one can't be certain about anything as poorly understood as the international economy, very poorly understood. Uh, but it's reasonably clear that the dismantling of the Bretton Woods system in the mid-70s uh, led to a decline in uh, deterioration of virtually all macroeconomic indicators. Uh, growth of the economy, product, growth of productivity, uh, capital investment all slowed. Uh, interest rates are far higher, which slows the Economic growth can also fluctuate much more, increases instability, undermines investment. Uh, financial crises have increased uh, with severe human cost. Uh, wages have stagnated or declined, while workloads have increased. That's particularly striking in the United States, uh, where real hourly wages for the majority of workers, non-supervisory workers, are more than 10% below what they were in the mid-70s, which is kind of astonishing, which usually continually goes up. Uh, and the workload has increased to the highest in the industrial world. Uh, global inequality has greatly increased. That's well known. The most dramatic figures are not among countries, uh, rather within the global population. There's a recent study by a World Bank economist, which just carries it up to the mid-90s, uh, 
who points out if you take the top 5% and the bottom 5% of the global population, their ratio of wealth was about uh, roughly 80 to 1 uh, in 1988, and it uh, went up to 114 to 1 uh, in 1994, and it's been increasing steadily since. The standard measure of inequality, the so-called Gini coefficient, has reached the highest level for the global population that's on record for any population in the past. Uh, the beneficiaries of this system commonly argue that it doesn't really matter very much if the, you know, if inequality grows as long as since the economy is raising all the boats. Uh, first of all, that's false. It matters quite a lot. Uh, inequality turns out to have very severe effects. But apart from being false, it's irrelevant uh, because most of the boats are sinking or barely staying afloat by paddling a lot harder. Uh, the period pre- and post-mid-1970s is quite commonly called by economists, uh, uh, many economists call the earlier period up to the mid-70s a golden age of you know, very high growth and increase of social benefits and so on, uh, followed from the mid-70s by what they call a leaden age. Uh, that's true even by conventional measures uh, the steady improvements that should be expected as a matter of course uh, have either slowed or reversed uh, apart from highly privileged sectors, which in the rich countries is a lot of people, not the majority, but a lot. Uh, the uh, situation is much worse if you look at measures uh, that matter for human life, like the social indices, index of social health, and much worse when you look at the poorer countries. Well, there are a number of crucial uh, indices that aren't discussed in the Fordham study. Let me mention a couple. Uh, one of them is insecurity, uh, which results from what's called technically labor market flexibility. Uh, the World Bank a couple of years ago in a development report pointed out that, I'm quoting, labor market flexibility has received a bad name as a euphemism for pushing wages down and workers out. Uh, actually, it's received that bad name because that's exactly what it is. Uh, but they say that, nevertheless, despite the bad name, uh, labor market flexibility is essential in all regions of the world. The most important reforms involve lifting constraints on labor mobility and on wage flexibility and breaking the ties between social services and labor contracts. That last phrase means uh, dismantling the improvements in the quality of life uh, that have been won over many generations of hard and bitter struggle. That has to be reversed. Uh, when they talk about increasing labor mobility, they're not ref referring to the foundations of free trade theory as described by Adam Smith, uh, who pointed out that free trade is based crucially on free movement of labor, free distribution of labor. They're not calling for that. That's out of the question. Uh, what they mean by increasing labor mobility uh, is increasing the possibility of kicking people out of their jobs. Uh, when they talk about increasing wage flexibility, they mean flexibility down, not up, except for a small number of people where it goes way up. Uh, the importance of all of this is quite widely recognized. Uh, Alan Greenspan, his testimony about the economy to Congress, uh, pointed out that greater worker insecurity, his phrase, Greater worker insecurity, he said, is an important factor in the health of the economy. Uh, it keeps inflation down. It's the most important thing for banks and so on. And the reason it keeps inflation down is because wa wages, uh, workers are just afraid. Uh, they're afraid to ask for wages and benefits, uh, while profits continue to soar uh, to heights that are described as dazzling and stupendous. Actually, the business press has run out of adjectives uh, years ago. Uh, and all of this improves the health of the economy by a certain criterion. Uh, how do you achieve all these beneficial results? Well, one is uh, flexibility of labor markets. That is the threat of firing. Now, but there are other measures. Uh, so it takes a NAFTA. Uh, uh, one effect of NAFTA, which was studied by a good labor historian, Kate Bronfenbrenner, Cornell, uh, in a study that was carried out uh, under NAFTA rules because of labor opposition is what was happening, uh, she discovered that uh, the threat of job, since NAFTA, the threat of job, the threat of job transfer has been used um, to break organizing efforts um, in about 50% of cases, which is quite high. Uh, 
and that when organizing efforts nevertheless succeeded, uh, the number of actual transfers tripled after NAFTA, but of course in the mobile industries like uh, manufacturing, not uh, construction. Well, all that's illegal, of course, but it doesn't make any difference. I mean, when there's a criminal state, it doesn't make any difference if actions are illegal. Uh, state corporate conclusion, collusion in uh, criminal activities uh, has other beneficial effects for the economy. So during the Reagan years, uh, illegal firing of the uh, union organizers went up very fast, about triple. Uh, also, industrial accidents went up very fast, almost doubled, uh, because uh, the OSHA regulations simply weren't enforced. Uh, and that's helps the corporate sector. So this was actually reported in some detail in Business Week, only place I've seen an account. Uh, all of this helps destroy unions, uh, and destroying unions uh, in, leads to the essential reforms, uh, namely increasing labor market flexibility with all of its uh, good consequences. Uh, apart from everything else, uh, there is a, there's a kind of a psychic effect, which is probably hard, which is hard to measure, but it's in undoubtedly severe to loss of security. And I suspect that it's finding its way into the social indicators. So, for example, into indicators like the sharp increase in child abuse uh, or child poverty, which is unusually high in the United States and is a form of severe child abuse. Well, there are other important effects of the contemporary form of globalization instituted by state corporate power in the past 25 years, uh, one significant aspect is undermining popular sovereignty uh, and substantive democracy, and that's very significant and understood. Uh, the uh, Bretton Woods system instituted by the United States and Britain primarily in the mid-40s uh, uh, regulated, basically kept, was based on regulation of exchange rates that can fluctuate a lot, uh, and also permitting countries to restrict capital flow. And there were very good reasons for that. And those reasons were explicit. They were explained and are well understood. Uh, the reason is that if, there, if free capital flow is allowed, that creates what's called a virtual parliament of concentrated global capital, which can exercise veto power over national policies that it considers irrational. Uh, it can exercise veto power simply by the threat to of capital flight, which is unsustainable, uh, and leads to depression and so on. Well, what kind of policies are irrational? Uh, essentially those that help people rather than profits. So labor rights, uh, education, and health, uh, stimulating the economy, those things, they can be vetoed by the virtual parliament if capital flight is free. And that was understood, very clearly understood. Uh, in the mid-1940s, when this system was in instituted, there was enormous popular support in the United States and elsewhere for social democratic and even more radical democratic measures, and the Bretton Woods system responded to that, uh, responded to that popular mood, a mood, incidentally, which the business world uh, regarded with very great concern. Uh, the National Association of Manufacturers, manufacturers warned that the quoting that the greatest hazard facing industrialists is the rising political power of the masses. Uh, they generally use a kind of vulgar Marxist rhetoric. It's not uncommon. Uh, the uh, values are reversed, but the assumptions are the same. Uh, the, uh, that led to an enormous corporate offensive uh, to undermine the threat of democracy uh, in the post-war period, that's been fairly well studied and should be better known. There's good academic work on it. Uh, the essential point lying b behind all this was brought out in a kind of a dry academic way in a very highly regarded history of the international monetary system by Barry Eichengreen. Uh, like others, he points out that before, that the current period of globalization, so-called, is rather like the pre-World War I period by gross measures, a lot of gross measures look similar. Uh, but there are some differences. And one crucial difference, he points out, has to do with democracy, with popular sovereignty. Quote him, uh, pre-World War I, government policy had not yet been politicized by universal male suffrage, the rise of trade unionism, and uh, parliamentary labor parties. So therefore, the very severe human costs of what's called financial rectitude 
that are imposed by the virtual parliament, it could be transferred to the general population who were defenseless. But that luxury was no longer available in the more democratic post-World War II period, and therefore at Bretton Woods, limits on capital mobility substituted for limits on democracy as a source of insulation from market pressures. That captures it pretty accurately, I think. There's also a corollary, namely dismantling of the post-war economic system since the mid-70s has led to a significant attack on substantive democracy, which in fact has happened, uh, not only in the industrial countries, but rather strikingly in the, in the South. There, the effect is enormous. In fact, for about half the population of the South, the developing countries, so-called, uh, national pro they don't even have control over national economic and social programs. Those are designed by the international bureaucracy uh, under conditionalities uh, imposed by the IMF, which are related to the so-called debt. I say so-called because the debt is not a simple economic fact. In large measure, it's an ideological construction. It looks quite different when you view it as an economic fact. I'll explain what I mean if you like, but wait, so I'll stop. Uh, the principle of, let me finish with a final example, the principle of undermining popular sovereignty uh, extends much more deeply than this. Uh, a lot of general popular discontent about what's going on was revealed rather dramatically and importantly at Seattle, and probably will be again in Washington in a couple of weeks. Uh, but the basic issues were, in my opinion, brought out much more clearly and sharply uh, in Montreal in uh, late January. In Montreal, there was an international uh, conference in late January to try to reach a what's called a biosafety treaty, biosafety protocol. Uh, quote from the New York Times, so you know I'm not misleading you. Uh, according to the New York Times account, uh, a compromise, rather ambiguous compromise was reached after intense negotiations that often pitted the United States against almost everyone else. Uh, what was at issue is what's called the precautionary principle. Uh, the European Union, which was on the other side, which is why there was a compromise. If there's only the third world on the other side, they just get smashed. Uh, but in this time, there were two power blocks opposing, so there was a compromise. Uh, the European Union defined the precautionary principle like this. Uh, countries must have the freedom, the sovereign right, to take precautionary measures with regard to genetically altered organisms that they feel might be harmful. Now, that means uh, seed, microbes, uh, animals, and crops. The United States opposed that. Uh, it insisted on the World Trade Organization rules, which are, quoting, an import can be banned only on the basis of scientific evidence, usually called sound scientific evidence. Uh, whether there is sound scientific evidence will be determined in a secret panel by representatives of the corporate world. Uh, so in brief, the world, and this is the pr fundamental principle of the World Trade Organization, uh, in, the principle is that people must be denied the right to say, I don't want to be an experimental subject. Actually, some of the uglier chapters of the history of medicine uh, have to do with the denial of that right to defenseless people, to slaves, to poor women, to ethnic minorities, and so on. Uh, but that has recently changed now, at least in principle. It's necessary to get consent forms before you carry out experiments with human subjects. So, for example, if, say, somebody from the Johns Hopkins Medical School walks in here and says, look, uh, you guys are going to be experimental subjects uh, in an experiment I'm carrying out where I'm going to give you some new drug or I'm going to stick an electrode in your brain or something or other uh, and see what happens, uh, according to present rules, you're allowed to say, no, I'm sorry, I don't want to be an experimental subject. Uh, but according to World Trade Organization rules, you don't have that right. Uh, you would first have to provide sound scientific evidence to be judged in secret by a panel of corporate representatives <laughs> that the experiment is going to harm you. And unless you can provide that evidence, you must be an experimental su subject. Okay? You have no right. That's the rule. And that was the issue. Uh, and uh, for the general population, that right has to be abrogated. That is, they must be experimental subjects so that U.S.-based corporations uh, can achieve uh, dazzling profits 
uh, thanks in large part to very large public subsidies and the protectionist devices that are also a crucial part of the World Trade Organization regime. Actually, these same issues, if you think them through, arise with regard to the so-called externalities that are dismissed. So unless there is sound scientific evidence that uh, environmental or ecological effects are harmful, then the population of the world must be experimental subjects, as well as future generations that have no vote in the market. Uh, that is, international conventions must be kept as weak as possible and ignored as much as possible, unless you can prove, get, provide sound scientific evidence that you experimental subjects are going to be harmed. You don't have a right to say, I don't want to, I don't want to try. No. Uh, that's again a crucial principle, uh, based on the underlying principle that the rights of people are incidental, uh, and the rights of profit and power to highly concentrated private tyrannies, which are unaccountable private tyrannies, which what they are, are paramount. Those are supreme values, often disguised as trade, but that's not the issue. Uh, well, there are, of course, beneficiaries to all of this, to these specific forms of uh, socio-political and economic organization that are misleadingly called globalization. Uh, among the beneficiaries are those conducting the experiments and relying on the concentration of power uh, to impose them on others. Uh, included also are those who are writing in praise of the uh, uh, institutional structure, its policies, its leaders, uh, just as they're also praising the leaders of the enlightened states for their virtue and magnificence. Uh, the beneficiaries include most of us uh, and uh, the circles in which we spend most of our lives. And for the same reasons, we have unusual power uh, that power provides opportunities, it offers choices, and we can hardly fail to understand uh, that the choices we make will have very substantial human consequences uh, today and for future generations. There will now be a brief question and answer period. We ask those of you with questions to form a line behind the microphone in the front of the auditorium on this side. And to please return to your seats once you've asked the question. Thank you. Um, it's kind of dark, so I can't see all that clearly. So if somebody wants to come up and start. Um, I just had a brief question. You um, criticized uh, U.S. action in Kosovo and then U.S. inaction in East Timor, but you didn't say which one you'd prefer. Um, so I was just wondering if you could give your opinion on that and then also uh, your opinion on countries such as Greece and Italy, which um, criticized our actions in Kosovo, and countries like Australia, which act, asked for more action in East Timor. Well, first of all, I didn't criticize our inaction in East Timor. I criticized our action in East Timor. The action in East Timor was the usual one to intervene to escalate the atrocities. And that, as I said, had been going on for 25 years and went on right through September 1999. Uh, the proper action in uh, East Timor for the last 25 years, as in Turkey and as in Colombia and many other places, would have been to stop participating in atrocities. Okay. Uh, that's simple, you know. Actually, there's a medical principle called first do no harm. Okay, so that's a good start. You can start by first doing no harm. Uh, the, uh, uh, so, so there's no contra. And in fact, the action in Kosovo also uh, increased the atrocities. Okay, uh, in Kosovo we should do the same as anywhere else. We should. There are, in principle, three possibilities. You know, just logically. You can act in such a way as to escalate atrocities, increase them. You can do nothing. Or you can act in such a way as to mitigate crimes. Okay, those are the three options. Well, in both cases that you mentioned, we acted to increase the atrocities. I mean, that's wrong. Okay. Uh, what should have been done in Kosovo? Well, you know, here you have to speculate about things that we don't know for certain. Uh, 
Uh, there's pretty, uh, Kosovo is a pretty ugly place before the bombing, according to the uh, latest, the last report. There was no changes going on. There was a steady level of, low level of violence. It was actually described in the, uh, uh, in the weekly and monthly reports that are coming along. And as I say, there's a lot of evidence about this. I have an article about it if you're interested, reviewing the recent data. Uh, the uh, latest UN report, and right before the bombing, uh, estimated about more than one violent death a day, which is not pleasant, not, you know, unfortunately, pretty characteristic of a lot of the world. And they also, and mixed, you know, kind of a mixture of uh, uh, Albanians and Serbs being killed. I was rather surprised at the distribution. The, uh, they also described the typical cycle of violence. The typical cycle of violence was uh, guerrilla, KLA guerrilla attacks, mostly from across the border, attacking Serb civilians and policemen, then what they call a disproportionate Serb response, uh, and then more guerrilla attacks. That was the regular cycle, and it was kind of steady. Nothing changing. That all changed sharply with the withdrawal of the monitors and the bombing. Then it went way up. Uh, uh, what was what were the alternatives? Well, you know, a lot of alternatives. I mean, for example, one alternative would have been instead of withdrawing the monitors, who had free access, as they say, increasing the number of monitors. So I suppose that the monitors were increased instead of withdrawn. Well, good chance that that would have uh, reduced the level of atrocity. Certainly wouldn't have increased them. Uh, could that have been possible? Well, it sounds, sounds likely, at least. Uh, the Serb parliament uh, strongly protested the withdrawal of the monitors right away uh, and called for their return. Well, were they lying? You know, who knows? I mean, NATO didn't want to take a chance, uh, so they uh, didn't follow that. But that means it was at least a possibility that the monitoring could have increased. Uh, were there diplomatic options? Well, you know, it looks like it. I mean, the uh, NATO at the very end, uh, handed, after there had been a pretty large agreement on a settlement, uh, added some new demands, which uh, were completely unacceptable and known to be unacceptable. It was known that they would be rejected. And they were added right at the end uh, as an ultimatum. And NATO didn't care about them. And we know that they didn't care about them because they withdrew them as soon as the volume started. And they're not in the final agreement. Okay, so one possibility would have been to withdraw the demands that were introduced to ensure that there wouldn't be a diplomatic settlement and to pay some attention to the uh, Serb, Serb proposal. There actually was one. It was never reported in the United States, uh, just as the NATO ultimatum was interestingly never reported until after the whole war was over. Or I knew about it. Uh, the newsrooms knew about it. Uh, the actual settlement happens to be a compromise. Uh, both sides gave up their more extreme demands and compromised on things they didn't want. So could that have settlement been, settlement have been reached without the bombing? Well, you know, can't know for sure, but it certainly made sense to try. Uh, so, yeah, it looked as if there were alternatives, but uh, NATO wanted the bomb, uh, especially the U.S. and Britain. As for Greece and Italy, it's a mixed story. Greece was strongly opposed. Uh, Italy, it's tricky. Officially, uh, it, it, officially, Italy supported it, and the Italian media were almost 100 percent in support. Uh, I happened to be in Italy for a month last November, and I did a lot of speaking about this, and it was kind of interesting. It's kind of like here. Uh, the educated sectors and the media were strongly in support. Uh, the population was very mixed, you know, uh, and in fact, in discussion, usually turned out to be opposed, which is not unlike here. Uh, it's the support is thinner there than here. Educated sectors are less disciplined than uniform. Uh, but uh, the picture was not all that different. Officially, Italy favored it. Not in advance. In advance, the Prime Minister of Italy visited uh, Washington a couple of weeks before the bombing and warned uh, Clinton that if NATO bombed, there would be hundreds of thousands of people driven out. Uh, in a retrospective, the Washington Post reviewed all of this in some detail. Uh, Clinton then, according to the Post, uh, turned to uh, Samuel Berger, his national security advisor, and said, okay, what do we do, Bambi, when they all start fleeing hundreds of thousands? And the answer was, we'll bomb more, you know, okay, which is what they did. Uh, why was the Prime Minister of Italy worried about hundreds of thousands of uh, Albanians being driven out as a result of a bombing? Well, because he knew where they were very likely to go, you know, he didn't want that. Uh, so, and this is one of many indications that they knew exactly what was going to happen. 
And it doesn't take a genius to figure it out either. You don't need secret intelligence to figure out that if you start bombing people, they respond. Okay. And they respond not where you're strong. They respond where they're strong. Okay. They, like they don't send jet planes to bomb Washington. Okay. They're strong on the ground, so they're going to respond on the ground. And if there's a threat of invasion and guerrilla action, they'll probably respond there, which in retrospect seems to be exactly what happened. Again, it didn't take a you know, PhD from science to figure this out. Uh, it, uh, and that's what happened. So I think there were alternatives. I think the wrong choice, uh, it's, I think it's absolutely clear that the wrong choice, in fact, the disgraceful choice, was taken in the case of East Timor. And let me stress that that choice is being taken as we speak. You know, If we want to keep quiet about it, okay. But we're participating right now in continuing crimes. Those I mentioned, there's still 150,000 people in concentration camps. The country is totally ruined. We have a major responsibility for all that. We're doing nothing about it. In fact, the U.S. is now, in, again, arming the Indonesian army, uh, even though the uh, U.N. forces on the ground are now reporting that uh, Indonesian armed and trained militias, including Indonesian forces, are re-entering East Timor. Okay, you can look away if you like, but uh, that's a choice. You've given us a list of problems that can lead one into a state of depression. Um, what changes do you suggest that each of us make in our lives to make the world a better place to live? I don't think, first of all, I don't think it should be depressing. The more you see problems and the more you realize that we're in a position to do something about them, uh, the result should be the opposite of depression, should be elation, you know. I mean, like if you were, a, if you were, a, say, a poor peasant in India and you're hearing about these things, yeah, you should feel depressed. There isn't anything you can do about it. Okay. If you're a rich person in the United States, there's a lot you can do about it. This is the center of power. Uh, this is, we're privileged. You know, we have access to resources, to information. Uh, we have opportunities and no death squads are going to come after us. I mean, we have opportunities that are simply not available in most of the world. So you don't really feel good about it. Uh, what should you do? Well, you know, it depends what you feel like working on. There's a long list. And nobody can do everything. In fact, nobody can do more than a tiny fraction of things. Uh, for example, if your interests happen to be right here on campus, you can be worried about uh, the living wage campaign. So, uh, if your interests... Uh, if your interests are... You know, if your interests are somewhere else, you can... Think about those things. There's no shortage of opportunities. There's just a shortage of will. Um, well, now that we've covered what we as individuals can do, what would you suggest that we as a state, um, as a people do? Uh, do you suggest going back to Bretton Woods? Do you suggest um, repegging our currency to the gold standard? What do you suggest doing? So what would be the proper way to deal with one specific problem namely what's called reforming the financial architecture, okay? I mean, the, the, the unregulated financial architecture is pretty widely recognized as a kind of a disaster. Uh, and uh, that involves two things. One aspect is what you described, the exchange rate variations. The other is the free flow, flow of capital, okay? And they require different, they call for different answers. With regard to uh, fixing up the exchange rate fluctuations and so on, there's a lot of substantive proposals around pretty well within the, and free flow of capital, within the framework of existing institutions, so very conservative modifications of existing institutions. And they've been around for a long time, like, for example, the Tobin tax, which was suggested by uh, James Tobin, the Nobel Prize winning economist about 25 years ago. So he suggested a small tax on financial, international transactions which would, as he put it, sort of throw sand in the gears. That is, make it expensive to carry out speculation. Uh, most of the, by now there's something like close to $2 trillion moving up and back a day in, uh, in just plain speculation against currencies and so on. Uh, and most of it is extremely short term, like about 80% of it has a return time of about a week, and most of it hours or even minutes. Uh, and if that was very slightly taxed, uh, it would slow it down. Well, taxing it requires cooperation, like one country can't do it. If any of the big countries decides to break the rules, it's finished. 
then everybody breaks the rules. Uh, but, you know, cooperation is not unknown on some things, like uh, when they feel like bombing Serbia, for example. Uh, the, uh, so, so that's a possibility. And there's a whole array of proposals like that. That's one. I and mean, if you want to list, uh, there's a kind of a very, there's, there's a couple of, instead of my running through examples, I'll just mention some literature. There's uh, the recent book that I quoted from is uh, John Eatwell and Lance Taylor called uh, uh, something like Global Finance or something. It just came out a couple of weeks ago, I think, Oxford or Cambridge. And they proposed a couple of concrete ideas, conservative ideas, you know, world financial administration, a bunch of other things. Uh, there's a book by um, an American University economist, uh, uh, Bl um, Robert Blecker, called Taming Global Finance. It was published by the good, very good economist, published by the Economics Policy Institute about a year ago, uh, running through the complete failure of uh, uh, models for financial markets, all of which are a total disaster, and suggest making some substantive and interesting proposals. So on those things, there are a lot of ideas. Uh, on uh, the further question of, say, allowing regulation of, of cutting back of financial flows, that's really not a matter of financial architecture. That's a matter of World Trade Organization rules and the whole demand for, liberals, for financial liberalization. Uh, the world, and it's part of a bigger story. So one big part of the World Trade Organization is uh, what's called the TRIMS measure, is a banning of all the measures, virtually all the measures that were used by industri currently industrialized countries to get to that state, and by the uh, 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 newly industrialized countries of Asia also used it. Uh, this is all kind of measures on controlling investment flows and capital flows, like, in, like uh, uh, requiring, say, local content or technology transfer or directed investment or strategic investments or infant, infant industry protection and so on. I mean, exactly the kind of things that account for the fact that the United States is not pursuing its comparative advantage in exporting fur, say, uh, which is what it would have done if it had followed the rules in uh, 1820, let's say what we'd be doing now. But uh, all of those measures are banned, and among them are uh, regulation on capital. So it really fits into a bigger picture. I don't think you can give it like a technical solution to it. Okay, you have to ask about revising this whole framework of uh, international economic agreements, which are mislabeled trade. Most of this has almost nothing to do with trade. Right? This has to do with freeing investors and lenders to do anything they feel like, no matter what the consequences. That's not trade. I mean, in fact, even the things that are called trade are extremely misleading, like uh, transfers across borders of objects, like an automobile part. That's called trade, right? But if you look at those transfers, uh, since transnational corporations are not monitored, there was a UN monitoring agency, but it was killed, mainly under U.S. pressure, so we don't have a lot of evidence. But there are studies, and the standard estimates, say, from the Brookings Institute, are that maybe on the order of 70% of cross-border transactions are centrally managed, uh, either intra-firm, you know, within a single firm, or else through outsourcing arrangements, which are basically centrally managed to cut back costs and benefits and so on. And their guess is maybe 70%, so, you know, maybe it's off by 20% in one or another direction. Uh, but that's a big piece of what's called trade, and that's not trade in any meaningful sense. That's corporate mercantilism. Uh, and when you add on to that strategic alliances, you know, like today, if you read the financial press, uh, GM's apparently buying up a big piece of fiat, okay? Uh, and they're all kind of interactions in all parts of the economy. You add up all of those things, what's called trade is, uh, you know, it's not a big phenomenon. Uh, there are interactions of all kinds, a lot of them cross borders, but they're not trade in any economically meaningful sense. Remember, every business firm, like even a mom, mom and pop grocery store, is a, uh, uh, is a market imperfection. Okay, that's a, a firm is defined in economic theory as a, a uh, market imperfection introduced to deal with transaction costs. Okay. Uh, and uh, the sort of theory is that the imperfections, the firms, are kind of like little islands uh, in a free market sea. But the problem with that is that the sea doesn't remotely resemble a free market, and the islands are bigger than the sea. You know. uh, 
so that raises some questions about the picture. But uh, these market imperfections, like a firm or a transnational corporation or a strategic alliance among them, uh, that, you know, this is a form of administering, of administering interchanges. And there's a real question about whether we want to accept it. I mean, why, for example, should the international socioeconomic system, or for that matter, our own society, uh, be in the hands of unaccountable private tyranny? That's a decision, you know, not a law of nature. So, the, and the question you're asking, I think, leads off in that direction when you get beyond the technicalities about reforming financial architectures. Thank you. <clears throat> it seems to me that you make uh, a lot of emphasis on the media and lack of information among the general population, like in the examples of East Timor or uh, the Kurds. However, there are international national estimates of awareness about inequality by like Kelly or Verba and others that show that the general population and in particular the elites are well aware of inequalities. So my point is, doesn't it make more sense to assume that uh, the elites, in particular in the US where there is more acceptance for inequality, know quite well uh, the consequences of their socioeconomic system for the whole globe? Uh, and they just accept it because it's in their best benefit and it's their, their ideology. Exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, the inequalities are not unknown. It's widely known that uh, inequality in the United States is now, after having declined through the golden age, you know, up till mid-70s it was declining. Since then it's been incre increasing. It's now probably about the level of the 1920s. Yeah, that's pretty well known. I mean, the global inequality figures are not well known. I mean, maybe specialists know them, but most people don't. Uh, and yeah, they like it. You know? In fact, the system was designed to yield that effect. Uh, and, the and there are beneficiaries like us. You know? I mean, I don't know you, but I would guess you, know, you and me are probably beneficiaries. You know, people, in our, people who are likely to be in the audience here are beneficiaries. Yeah, there's a sector that benefits from all of this. And they like it, and they make the decisions, and they know exactly what they're doing. Uh, and they don't need more evidence about it. They got it all in front of them. Read Business Week and Fortune and the Wall Street Journal. They're just uh, delighted. I mean, they're also delighted about the harm to everyone else. Uh, so in 1992, about the early 90s, uh, by that time after you know the Reagan period, uh, U.S. labor costs per unit output, you know what it costs in labor to get something produced. Uh, which had been the highest in the world, as you would expect for the richest country in the world. It should be the highest in the world. Uh, by the early 90s, they had declined to the lowest level of the industrial world. And the Wall Street Journal uh, described this uh, with ecstasy as a, as a phrase, a welcome development of transcendent importance. You know, not a small thing. Uh, Business Week chimed in by saying that now at last uh, workers are going to have to give up their luxurious lifestyles you know, uh, and uh, kind of suffer properly. Uh, the Financial Times, you know, the main, the main international business journal in London, uh, it, around the same time, had an article about how everything's collapsing in Eastern Europe, total wreck. Uh, but they had an article which had the nice title, uh, Green Shoots in Communism's Ruins. And the green shoots were uh, that uh, since the whole country is collapsing, the whole Eastern Europe is collapsing as they're being driven back into the third world with neoliberal reforms, uh, wage levels are going down and people are desperate and so on. But it happens that they're not like typical third world countries yet. They're still well educated and healthy and so on because of this bad period they've been through. Uh, so therefore you have this great phenomenon. These are the green shoots. Extremely cheap labor, which can undercut Western workers and drive down their luxurious lifestyle. But they're educated and skilled, and although they didn't say it, white and blue-eyed, you know, which helps too. Uh, and uh, so that's great. So green shoots, you know. And this is not a secret. I mean, quoting from the front pages. You know. Yeah, this is by design. And not very surprising. I mean, policy planning typically is in the interest of designers. Should that surprise you? you know? I mean, it'd be kind of a miracle if it, if it wasn't. I mean, it's kind of the task of educated classes to suppress this truism and to talk about noble intent and, you know, all these marvelous things. That's what you're supposed to do if you're an educated person, not just in our society. It's historically true. Uh, 
uh, but uh, I mean, if uh, you know, if people who design a system do it in their own benefit, you know, should hardly be a shouldn't need a big headline for that. I mean, that's the kind of stuff you got to teach in elementary school. Hi, I want to thank you for everything you've ever written. You're my hero. Um, on the internet, I was uh, I was perusing uh, some of your internet chat pieces, uh, and there was a piece talking about Cambodia and whether or not it was a little while ago, I believe, around the beginning of '99. You were kind of debating uh, an attack on Anthony Lewis. I mean, you're defending yourself. Anyway, at the end of that small piece. You said, great, bring Pol Pot to trial, but what about Kissinger, Suharto, and a long list of others who quickly come to mind? I would, uh, a two-part question I would like to know for uh, exactly how we could bring Kissinger to trial, for exactly what war crimes. I agree that we should, but I don't know how. And in my and, uh, second part of that question, on the release of Pinochet from Britain, do you think higher levels of U.S. government had a, a role in that? And uh, do you think Henry himself was uh, instrumental in trying to save his own neck? Well, on the second, on the second question, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm sure they were pretty nervous about it, because if there had been a real trial of Pinochet, it wouldn't have been so easy to cut it off at exactly the right point. I suspect that's the reason for the uh, unwillingness to allow an international tribunal for Suharto or for East Timor altogether. You know. Because, again, that one's going to be really hard to cut off at the right point. Uh, I mean, everything I said tonight that just barely touches the surface uh, is known. In fact, a lot of it is said, for example, in Moynihan's memoirs. Uh, and uh, it would be hard to cut that off. So I suppose that's the reason why there isn't going to be any trials. Uh, how would you – I mean, as for what, what would be the war crimes in Kissinger's case, I mean, you know, that would take another lecture, but there's plenty of them. Uh, for example, Cambodia is one. Uh, Kissinger was crucially involved in the uh, decision to uh, um, uh, invade Cambodia, okay, uh, and then to carry out the extensive and murderous bombing of Cambodia. I mean, inner Cambodia was subjected to brutal bombing in the early 70s. According to the CIA, 600,000 people were killed. I don't know what the actual number is, nor do they, uh, in the whole war, not just the bombing. The bombings started off a big war, which ended up destroying a lot of inner Cambodia. Uh, and, uh, you know, like when, when Pol Pot regime came into power, uh, U.S. Uh, intelligence and U.S. aid were there were estimating that, uh, well, as they put it, it would take two years of slave labor just to get the country back on its feet again you know, after what had been done in the preceding years. Well, it's not all Kissinger, but he had a big part in it. Uh, he also had a very big part in similar things that were going on at the same time in Laos and, and uh, uh, South Vietnam. I mean, South Vietnam was being massacred in 1969. The U.S. war in Vietnam was mostly against South Vietnam. That's not admitted here, but that's true. Just as much as the Russian invasion of Afghanistan was against Afghanistan, the way they put it, it was defending Afghanistan. But you know, you don't bother laughing at that. Uh, the U.S. war in Indochina was primarily against South Vietnam, and it picked up steam extensively in 1969 in what were called the post tet Accelerated uh, Campaign, pacification campaigns, with intensive bombing, uh, murderous. Uh, Counter, uh, counterinsurgency uh, pacification operations, and nobody knows how many people were killed. In Laos, uh, uh, the major bombing of, Laos, bombing of Laos had been going on, but it really picked up uh, when Kissinger got in. In fact, what happened is that they were sort of forced into peace negotiations with North Vietnam, so the planes were free, and they were shifted over to bomb Laos and, and Cambodia. Uh, Laos was, large parts of Laos were just wiped out. I mean, to this day, there are hundreds or maybe thousands of people a year being killed just from unexploded ordnance on the plain of jars alone, you know, one area of northern Laos, which is littered with unexploded ordnance from those years. Uh, that one I know pretty well. I interviewed refugees from there back in 1970 when they were being driven out for the first time. It was just horrendous. And they're still dying. The people who want to do something, you can do something about it. Uh, there are mine-clearing groups there from Britain, 
not from here. You know. We bomb and we leave unexploded ordnance, but we don't clear it. In fact, the British uh, mine clearing experts have complained that the Pentagon won't even give them instructions on how to defuse the ordnance, which is endangering them. Uh, well, all that's known. In fact, you can even read about it in some detail in the Wall Street Journal. However, in the Asian edition of the Wall Street Journal, they didn't print it in the American edition by their top Asian hand, Barry Wayne. Uh, so those are things, you know, that, that's all of that's part of Kissinger's act, but it's only the beginning. Uh, Chile was another case. Uh, another case, and it's a long story, I don't want to go into it in detail, but another case is what's called here the Middle East peace process. I mean, the Middle East, well, Kissinger had a big hand in that. Uh, just to give you the essence of it, which is no, it ought to be known by everybody in the press, but I never see it anywhere. Uh, for the the, the so-called peace process is based on a UN resolution, UN 242 of November 1967, which was uh, put through under U.S. initiative. Okay. Uh, UN 242 called for total Israeli withdrawal from the occupied territories in return for total peace. That's UN 242. It was totally rejectionist. It said nothing about the Palestinians. You know, not, they weren't even mentioned. But it was an agreement between among states. Israel was, withdraws to the borders from before attack, and in return it gets full peace. Well, that was U.S. policy right up until... February 1971. In February 1971, uh, the president of Egypt, Sadat, accepted it. He said, okay, we'll accept U.S. policy. Full peace treaty with Israel, if Israel withdraws just from Egyptian territory. Didn't say anything about the risk. Uh, the State Department was in favor of that. Kissinger blocked it. Uh, he called for what he called stalemate, uh, meaning no negotiations, just reliance on violence, uh, which was Israel's position. They didn't like it. So the United States did have to make a choice, and he won out in that battle. Uh, the end result of that has been, you know, 30 years of wars, uh, atrocities. I mean, the 1973 war, for example, was largely Kissinger's war. Uh, the current so-called peace process is in terms of the Kissinger version. For 25 years, for 30 years, in fact, the U.S. was alone, literally alone. You take a look at the U.N. resolution literally alone with Israel in blocking a diplomatic settlement uh, because it insisted on a partial withdrawal as the U.S. determines, not total withdrawal. And it still does. Uh, after the Iraq war, the U.S. was able to ram through its own position, finally, Kissinger's position. The U.S. was further isolated and it was the only country in the world, practically, that didn't recognize Palestinian rights. In fact, it had to veto Security Council resolutions and so on. That's the background of the so-called peace process, which is fully rejectionist, rejects Israeli withdrawal, rejects Palestinian rights, and in fact does not even rise to the level of uh, South Africa in the period of uh, the Bantu stands. That's called the peace process, and Kissinger has a big role in that. Well, you know, how many deaths and how much terror you attribute to that, you could argue, but it's not a little. And then it goes on from there. There's plenty. Uh, how does one do anything about this? Well, personally, I don't think a tribunal is in order. Uh, it seems to me the tribunal of public opinion is what is required. So instead of suppressing all of this stuff in the uh, general literature, including, I'm sorry to say, the scholarly literature, it should be everybody should know about it. That's enough of a tribunal. And that can be done. That's within our power. Professor Chomsky, um, started with one question, now you came into another one. Do you think if Israel withdraws from southern Lebanon, will Lebanon as a state exist? Would the, ten, would the tensions within that community, after so many years, allow it to survive? That's a good question, and, you know, it's really hard to say. I mean, uh, Lebanon has been through a horrible time uh, since around 1970. Uh, the... Uh, I mean, just since 1982, uh, Israeli attacks, which means U.S. attacks, remember, Israel can do this only because the U.S. arms, supplies them, and authorizes it, okay? So whatever I say Israel, I mean Washington. Uh, Israeli attacks since 1982 uh, have, uh, have killed probably something like 50,000 people in Lebanon and uh, uh, that's Lebanese and Palestinians, and repeatedly driven hundreds of thousands out of their homes. You know, 
And before that, there were unknown thousands or tens of thousands being killed in bombing attacks of areas, laid waste, and so on. In the early 70s, there was up and back terror. But from the late 70s, mostly Israeli attacks, meaning U.S. attacks. Uh, Syria got in there in 1976. Syria is a very ugly, brutal place. Uh, they got in in 1976 with the support of the United States and Israel because they were coming in to attack Palestinians. So that was good. Uh, they came in to, you know, establish the rule of the Christian minority, and they were mainly attacking Palestinians. Big massacre in Tel Al Zatar right away. So the U.S. and Israel basically authorized it. Uh, after the Gulf War, George Bush again authorized Syrian, you know, domination of Lebanon as a kind of quid pro quo for their taking part in his uh, Gulf War. Uh, and Syria is there. There's no doubt about it. That's not good for Lebanon. In fact, horrible. Uh, if Israel pulls out, well, you know, that'll eliminate one problem, Israeli occupation of the south. Uh, and that means constant attacks further north because they go on all the time. Uh, and Israel is, in fact, uh, required to leave by a 1978 uh, Security Council resolution, which, again, the U.S. signed, but nullified. So it doesn't matter. Uh, but that leaves the society with plenty of internal problems. Uh, confessional problems, uh, you know, conflict, uh, breakdown of infrastructure, massive corruption, you know, unbelievable corruption, uh, huge problems. Uh, whether they can pull themselves out of it, I don't know. We could help, you know, instead of harming. But whether we could help enough to help it make it work, I don't know. On behalf of the symposium, we'd like to thank Professor Chomsky once again for his wonderful presentation. Thanks as well to all of you for attending our program this evening, and a special thanks to those of you who travel from other parts of the city and other parts of the state to be with us tonight. We hope you can all join us for our next event, which will be this Wednesday, March 15, right here in Shriver Hall. Our guest will be Senator George Mitchell, a former majority leader of the U.S. Senate and the chair of the peace negotiations in Northern Ireland. We invite you now to a brief reception for Professor Chomsky upstairs in the Clipper Room. Thank you once again for coming, and have a pleasant evening. Thank you very much.